Um, so in, in the body of Christ today, in the church, there's a lot of discussion about who we were before we before we existed or who we were in bygone eras before the fall who man was before the fall there's a lot of ideas about it and i believe as as i was sitting and preparing and considering the inheritance tonight i believe there was a a real resounding answer that began to stir in my heart and uh, to really speak to the church, and 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 as we go through this, I, I think it'll it'll it can clear up a number of questions. And it and whatever I say, it's always for you to look at, look at, and consider with the Lord. You don't have to agree. You don't have to disagree. Just consider it with the Lord. But we've been in the inheritance of the Lord for uh, quite some time, the, the seed and inheritance. And so we've been in Acts 13 for four or five weeks has been our main scripture. And just to bring us back into together with, with the thought from Acts 13, we'll look back at it. And then we're going to move on into the book of Hebrews. So we're going to move from Acts 13. If you want to uh, be ready, we'll move from Acts 13 to Hebrews chapter, I believe it's two to start with. And we'll be in quite a bit of Hebrews, actually uh, chapter five to start with. So, so in Acts 13, enough said. If you want to have both of those places marked, Paul, uh, Paul, or the, well, the writer of Hebrews says, and I believe Paul is speaking here, but the writer of Hebrews says, men and brethren, verse chapter 13, verse 26, men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you fears God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. For they that dwell at Jerusalem and, the ruler, and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. And though they found no cause of death in him, yet desired they Pilate that he should be slain. And when they have fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in the sepulcher. But God raised him from the dead. And he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God has fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is written in the second psalm, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said, on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies or sure blessings of David. Wherefore he said, if in another Psalm, thou shalt not suffer thy holy one to see corruption. And we'll stop right here. So we've dealt with this for some weeks. We could probably deal with this for some years. <laughs> But this piece here, the glad tidings, the good news, we declare unto you good news, how that the promise made, was made to the fathers, God has fulfilled. So the promise made has been fulfilled in that he raised up Jesus from the dead. So the fulfillment is in he raised up Jesus. And then he tells you, he pulls this together, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So, so in Jesus being raised from the dead, we co what comes into view 
is a new man begotten of God, born of God, out from the dead. There's so many things you could say here. Jesus was raised out from the dead. And especially with all the thoughts on resurrection that's that's went on in in these last few weeks, Jesus being raised from the dead fulfills, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And if the church would get a hold of this, it would clear up a lot of questions. So he's begotten out from the dead. Now the dead, which we know, are those in Adam, and Adam all have died, all are dead. In Christ, all are made alive. So, so the all that, at least I believe, that are made alive in Christ are all those that have the Spirit of Christ. And I believe Paul really brings this out. He says, he that have not the Spirit of Christ are not his. And I alluded to the fact that there are many teaching that all Jesus has done is brought us back to what Adam was or how God thought about us before the fall. Now, how he thought about us, that may be true, because he always considered he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, but, but the thought comes that the way we are is what God always wanted. We just didn't know it. There's there's this idea out here that if we would just get our thought process right, everything would be good. But tonight, I want to show you distinctly that this eternal life was really the thought of God. God desired life in man. And that life wasn't just to live a long time. So the eternal life wasn't just that man would never physically die, but the eternal life was that the life of God would be imparted to man. I believe that was the eternal thought. That was what Paul meant when he said he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, is that the choosing was always in Christ. It was always in eternal life. And life was that which God is. That's what God is. God is life. God is light. For us to have life is to have God. To not have God is to be dead. So, so when we look at this, and I, and I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 5, start at verse 1. And, and notice in verse 1 what the writer says real close. It says, for every high priest, Hebrews 5 verse 1 says, for every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God. I want you to mark that. Things pertaining to God. That he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way for that he himself is also compassed with infirmity. And by reason hereof, he all asked for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. And no man takes this honor into himself, but he that is called of God as was Aaron. So Christ also, so also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest. But he that said unto him, thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. Look at this. This begotten from the dead goes into Christ's priesthood. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Remember, we just read this in Acts 13, that is speaking of the resurrection. As he saith in another place, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. 
And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all that obey him, called of God and a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now, I wrote a note to myself as I was looking at this. What is the main thing pertaining to God? You know, the, the priests are to offer in the Old Testament things, or the Old Covenant, things pertaining to God. Well, what would be the main thing pertaining to God? A question. And I wrote another question. Would it be the nature of his life? Is that the main thing pertaining to God? The nature of his life. Now, Christ as a high priest was the only high priest that could bring us into his life. Okay? Why is that? Because that's the life he has. That's the life he was before he became a man. But as a high priest, he is raised out from the dead by the glory of the Father, by the life of God. So he's not raised out from the dead by the life of Adam. He's raised out from the dead by the life of God. So as a high priest, he can minister this life to you and I. This life, I don't believe, brothers and sisters, that the old creation man had, even in the garden. I know a lot of people do. I don't think so. This is the eternal life that was with God, that was hidden God, that was God. Don't believe Adam was God. And this life is made known and accessible through the Lord Jesus Christ. Only he as high priest, could bring us into this life. Now, Timothy speaks of this, or Paul and Timothy speaks of this life. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, if you turn there, Paul says, and start at verse 14, says, that thou keep this commandment without spot and rebukable unto the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show, who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality dwelling in the light, which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Now notice what he says. No man can approach. No man have seen it, nor can see it. Now, now I want you to turn over to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. And I want you to see what John says. John says here, writes here, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested and we have seen it, and bear witness and show unto you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. So the life was with the Father and was manifested unto the disciples, unto the apostles, in the person of Jesus Christ. It was physically manifested. They saw the life of God in the man, Jesus Christ. Now, I don't think this is all John is talking about, though. 
John is stating, I believe from spiritual comprehension that the life of God is being made manifest through Jesus Christ in John, just like Paul writes in Galatians chapter one, when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb to reveal his son in me. See, this revelation of the son in you is this life that was from the beginning. This life that I believe was in the heart of God that would, would fill the hearts of men. This life. Now, this isn't soul life. This is God life. This is God nature. God's nature is a whole different life than man. So when you go through the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, and you look at the priesthood, the priesthood offered sacrifices that, like the writer Hebrews says, in accordance to the purifying of the flesh, but it could never purify the conscience because only God life could change the consciousness. That's why as Christians, many times we, we try to come to this place of do good. And I, and I do think folks, we should come to a place of doing goodness, but the doing goodness comes out of this life dwelling in you. And so Jesus, as the eternal high priest, is the only one that can minister this life. Why? Well, he says in John, is recorded in the book, I believe, John chapter 8, John 8 or 11, I believe it's 8. Unless a corn of wheat falls into the ground and die, it abides alone. That it, he's the only one that has this life. And unless he falls and dies into the ground, the earth is not going to know this life. It's only going to know man life. And so God life is ministered by the high priest. That's what Christ is ministering to you and I. He's ministering his death, which is death to the old man, burial, and resurrection. And in the resurrection is God life, not Adam life. So we're not raised up to be better Adams. We're not raised up to be better Waynes. We're raised up to be the expression of Christ as this life is made manifest in our hearts. That's the only way it can happen. God has this life. You and I individually don't have it. Now, corporately with him, we now have this life. But this life is him living in you and I. It's not something we originated with, folks. It, it, it originates out of God. It is God. It's what and who God is. God is this life. So this eternal life that was hidden, this eternal life that was with the Father was made manifest in the person of Jesus Christ, lived a perfect life among humanity, and died on the cross, raised out from the dead to minister this life to you and I. See, see Jesus in his origin being in the form of God, had no reason to minister this life to himself. He had purpose 
to minister this life into man. And this life that we come to know that changes our conscience, changes our mind, changes our heart is God life. That's the order of an endless life. That's the order of Melchizedek. This life that always was before there was a man, before Adam was ever in a garden, this life that always was, was purposed in the heart of God to be manifest in creation. That man would fellowship this life. And we fellowship this life in the relationship, I believe, of the Father and the Son. This now I'm not trying to separate God, so don't let me confuse you. But we know this relationship in Christ. That's the only place we ever know this, this life. And see, Jesus makes a powerful statement to Martha and Mary. He says, to, or to Martha, in that setting with Martha and Mary, he says, I am the resurrection. And we hear that. I am the resurrection. But he doesn't stop there. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. See, the life of the resurrection is Christ. So the life that you and I come into in the resurrection is the life of Jesus Christ. This life is ministered to us by our high priest. That's how it's ministered. Can't be ministered any other way. Because he's the only one that can minister it. So he makes God life known in our hearts. That's what he does. That's what we experience in new birth. That's what we experience in the outpouring of the spirit, the overflowing of the Holy Ghost, however, however you want to say it. That's what we experience when Christ is revealed. That's what we experience as Christ begins to be formed in us. We begin to experience his life. I am the resurrection and the life. Now, folks, that is what was from the beginning. That's what God purposed in man was the life. And only the high priest of God could enter into the presence and share the presence of God with his corporate body. That's what all that, that type and shadow in Israel of the high priest going in with the breastplate, with, with the 12 stones upon his chest and the stones upon his shoulder, is he was coming into the presence with his very own body. And that's what Christ did. Christ became a man. And Father, glorify me with thine own self, with the glory that I have with thee before the world was. And going back into the presence, he and he alone ministers this life into you and I. He and he alone. And you and I participate in this life. You and I come to know this life. You, you and I share this life. But honey, he is this life. So it's never something we have separate from him. It is Christ being formed in you. That's what this great salvation is. That's what this one that is begotten from the dead is begotten from the dead to do, to declare, like it says in, in Hebrews chapter 2. If you turn there, Hebrews 2, verse 10, it says, For it became him for whom all are all things, and by whom are all things, and bringing many sons into glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. For both he that sanctified and they who are sanctified are all of one. 
for which cause he's not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. See, only Jesus can declare the name of the Lord. What do I mean? Only he can show the nature of God. Only he can make known that of God in our hearts to be manifested out of us, to be shared into the earth. But only he has it. We have it joined to him. We don't individually have this life. This is his life working in us. And he declares it unto his brethren. In the midst of the church, he says, I will sing praise unto thee. See, that's what Christ does. When you see that of Christ, it's a praise unto the Lord. It's a praise unto God. That of Christ revealed in you becomes a praise unto God. And again, verse 13 says, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I am the children which God hath given me, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through, through fear of death were all their lifetime subject, subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people, for in that he himself have suffered being tempted, he's able to secure, secure them that are tempted. So he ministers the things of God. Where does he minister them at? To his body. He declares the name of the Lord to his body. What's that mean? He declares this is what God is. You know, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. When you see this life, that's made known in Christ. This is what God is. This is who God is. And folks, I tell you, when you see this life, you realize in and of yourself, you're not that life. The glory of it is he has given it to you. He has shared this life. He has made this life known that it would change our hearts and our minds, that it would transform our being, and only this life can. See, see the law, I hear a brother, I probably can't say it as well as he does, but I hear a brother I listen to often talk about that, that the law will conform you to doing good things, but it can't transform. See, this life has the power to transform. And this life is what we now have in Christ. It's what he is. It's what he is. And as a high priest, it's what he's ministering. He's bringing us into the presence of God. I believe with all my heart, that's what the Holy of Holies represents is the church. When you see the cherubim of glory, beholding the glory of the Lord, the angels upon that beaten work in the Holy of Holies, what they're looking at is the glory of God. That's why they're gold. Because the, the glory of the divine nature is changing, just like Paul says, into the same image, that we are changed from glory to glory. We are changed, transformed by the Spirit of God, by seeing him. That's where the change comes. And that's spiritual comprehension. That's not physically laying your eyes on it. 
that is spiritual, spiritually seeing him, the eyes of your heart being enlightened, the eyes of your mind seeing that of Christ. And we see that of Christ to be changed into the same image, into the same likeness, to manifest that of him. But again, it's not something of us in and of ourselves. It's ministered to us. It's declared to us through our high priest, through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now turn over to the book of Hebrews. Chapter, give me a second here. I believe I want chapter 7. Yes. Chapter 7. Says. Verse 11. If therefore perfection. Were by the Levitical priesthood. For under it the people received the law. What further, further need was there that another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? See, see, the completion could never be under the law. Perfection, the word perfection could be swapped here to completion. So the completion of all things could never be under the law. So, so there was a need for another priest to come. And this priest that was coming was in the order of the life of God. That's what this order of Melchizedek's dealing with, is the life of God, and not be called after the order of Aaron. For the priesthood being changed, there's made of necessity a change also of the law. For he of whom the th these things are spoken pertains to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar, for it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there arises another priest who is made not after the law of carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. This, this is what he's made high priest, after the power of this life this life we've been talking about, this life that was from the beginning, that, that was out of God, manifesting to the earth in the person of Christ. He's made a priest of this life. Verse 17, for he testifies, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. For the law made nothing perfect but the bringing in of a better expectation or a better hope did, by which we draw nigh unto God. How do we draw nigh unto God in this life? When this life is manifest in our hearts. See, it's bringing us closer to God. It's bringing us to an awareness of what he is. Why is he bringing us to an awareness of what he is, because that was his desire. I believe it's his desire for the whole earth that that the glory of the Lord would be seen. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Verse 20, and inasmuch as it's not without an, an oath, he, he was made priest, for the, those priests were made without an oath. But this with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Why does it say forever? Because this is what completes you and I. It's his life. See, what completes you and I is not simply not sinning anymore. Okay. We walk out today, 
never commit another sin. All right, that's a good thing. That's a noble thing. That's a, you could say, a just thing. But will that fulfill your heart? No. Because your heart was made for this life. Now, this life does not have sin in it. This life doesn't miss the mark. This life doesn't have corruption or decay in it. This life is not the nature of Adam. It's the nature of God. See, that's that's what our heart's fulfillment is, is the nature of God and nothing less. I believe that's what we were cre created for, that God's life would be born in us. And the power of this is not you or me. The power of this is Christ living in you. Christ living in me. And you and I coming to know him by the spirit of the Lord. And in this knowing, coming to exhibit him. See, we want to get to the exhibiting part. That's This is what a lot of people want to do in the, if you want to call it the kingdom message, the sonship message, or whatever you want to call it, they want to come to the exhibiting part. The exhibiting part comes by knowing him. I don't think there's another way. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have not this life. He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood has, Jesus says, life. But it's not just natural life. It's not just good works. He's talking about, he's talking about God life. He's talking about the life that's out from God. And how we have this life is we eat his flesh and drink his blood. He ministers himself to us. Glory to God. This is the order of Melchizedek, the power of an endless life. See, this is the life that that man didn't know that was only made known in Christ. Honey, man didn't know this life. I haven't seen, ear haven't heard, never entered into the heart of man the things that God prepared for him. And where did God prepare them at? You know, the traditional church believes God, you know, Jesus went to heaven to prepare things for us. Honey, he prepared an interest into the very divine presence and life of God. That's what he prepared. I go to prepare a place for you. He was going to the cross. He was going into death, burial, and resurrection to bring an entrance way into the divine life that he himself was going to make known. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. I'll, I'll pray the Father. He'll send another comforter unto you. And he tells him, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come unto you. At that day, you will know. You will know I am in the Father, you in me, and I in you. You're going to come to know a life that's going to change your mind. It's going to change your viewpoint. It's going to move out of the earth into the heavens. It's going to move out of carnality into spiritual. And this work is done by the Spirit of God. It's done in you and I by His Spirit. Well, how, how do we attain something so high? Eating His flesh and drinking His blood. Fellowshipping the land setting our hearts and our minds toward him. Honey, from, from an effort standpoint, I don't know what else to tell you. I don't know outside of feeding on the Lord. I don't know what else to say because my effort can't attain it. <laughs> my ability can't achieve it. We're, we're dealing with something beyond our capability that's in ourselves. 
But what God has done in Christ is he has grabbed us, if we can hear it, and brought us into himself. That's what Jesus said. At that day, you'll know I am in my Father. You are in me. And I am in you. And how are you going to know that he is in you? Because this life will be made known. This life will fill your heart. This life will fill your mind. You'll come to a seeing and hearing of the life of God. That's how you know. You come to a divine fellowship with the Lord. A fellowship that your mind could never imagine. That your eye had never seen. Just, just what I quoted. I haven't seen the ear, haven't heard. Oh, but it'll be ministered to you by our great high priest. Because only he can minister this. Only he could bring an entrance into the divine life of God. And only he can make it known. Why is that? Because he came out of it. He went back into it. But when he went back into it, <clears throat> Hebrews says he brought many sons to glory. He brought many sons into the splendor of God. Oh, but how do I know the splendor of God? How do I participate in the splendor of God? You have to know him, that I may know him. That's what Paul came to, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. So Paul never pointed back to knowing what I was back in the garden before Adam fell. Paul pointed to knowing him and the power of his resurrection. Paul pointed to this life. One last place, Colossians, and I'll stop. Colossians chapter 3. This absolutely one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible. It says, verse one, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. What's above? The things of God. <laughs> Where Christ sit upon the right hand of God. He we 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 talked about this other night that that through the power of God, all these I, I said one more scripture, but I'll flip over to Peter so I don't mess it up. But all these things are held through the power of God for us to receive. But he says, if you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead. And your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, shall appear, then... Only then will you appear with him in glory. What brings you into seeing the glory of the Lord, what brings you into knowing the glory of the Lord is Christ, our life, appearing. This word appear is the same word as manifest. When he is manifest, when he is made known, when he's rendered apparent, Where's he rendered apparent at you? Rendered apparent at, according to Paul earlier in Colossians, he says, Christ in you is the expectation of glory. And I believe him being rendered apparent is the glory. Now, he's not rendered apparent just one time. It's not one time that you glimpse the glory of the Lord. This is an ongoing relationship that you're glimpsing, you're seeing, you're knowing that of God. And this is through Christ being made known, Christ being rendered apparent by the Spirit of God. In 1 Peter, which we've read a number of times here lately, just real quick, and I will stop here. Chapter 1 says, verse 3, 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you. See, this is the same thing in Colossians. Set your affections on things above. These things that are reserved in heaven for you that are kept by the power of God, who are kept by the power of God through faith into the salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. It's these things, this, this thing of inheritance, this incorruptible, undefiled inheritance that's in Christ that doesn't fade away, this new life that you have. It's reserved, it's kept by the power of God. It's kept at the right hand of God. Say, I believe the same thing Paul's saying in Colossians, set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. When Christ, who is our life, that's how these things are made known. That's how these things are realized. That's how these things are formed in our hearts. He is made known. He is manifest. He is declaring the name of the Lord to his brethren. He is creating a praise or singing a praise like we read in Hebrews 2 unto God. Honey, when he's revealed, it's, I'm telling you, it's a praise unto the Lord. You see that of him. And the glory of this for you and I is he's brought us into himself. He's making himself known through the revelation, through the knowing of Jesus Christ, our Lord, through the ministry of our high priest. Well, I'll stop right here. The Lord bless you, Brother Mark.